Okay, so I'm just there. This video is very difficult because it's hard to become. I'm not even sure how to go about from here. Uh, basically, it's trying to work. <laughs> See, now I don't even know how to go okay. about Okay, so, so this is a, a very difficult video to make chronologically because I'm in a different situation than somebody else. I'm in a different trade than somebody else. Um, but basically we all start off broke, um, moving out of our parents' house or maybe just living in a uh, parent's house, just finished high school. So where do you start? First, you need to realize that um, you want to be 100% sure that you do want to be a mechanic. There's, uh, if you hop on Kijiji and Craigslist, you'll see lots of toolboxes for sale, fully loaded uh, for say 30 cents on the dollar. Um, so make sure that um, you actually want to be a mechanic. It is difficult, it is stressful, um, it is dirty, and you're not as appreciated as you might hope. <laughs> that being said, the first thing you're gonna do is go out and buy a box. Now this is my second box. When I became a mechanic, I was 16. I worked as a summer job and I didn't have that much expendable income. So first thing I did, um, I bought all my tools new and the first thing I did was buy a box. Now Husky had a really nice box at the time I'm walking through. I could have bought that Husky box and not had a penny left over for tools. Instead I went to Princess Auto which is US's version of Harbor Freight and bought an international box. No roller slides just the bottom box and then I went and bought the Sears, uh, the wish book, if anybody remembers that. I bought the biggest socket and wrench set uh, on there and I think it was 700 bucks and that is still most of my sockets that I have at the top right now. The box is kind of like your truck. It will get you to the job site but if you spend all your money on the truck and you have no money left over for the tools to do a construction job or a mechanics job, what's the point? Um, you need to invest in decent tools and at the same time, if you're starting out, I don't think you need to buy the best tools either. When I, when I first started, one of the mechanics had nothing but snap on and he looked at me and said, if I did it all again, I would buy Mastercraft and um, Craftsman. So that's what I did. I listened to somebody who was already there and followed their advice. I don't regret it. Now, undoubtedly the sockets are probably not as good as Snap-on or Mac or anything name brand. At the same time, I've lost a lot of sockets and I've still broken lots of sockets. Um, and whether you lose a $100 socket or a $8 socket, you still lose it. I was really happy with that setup. Uh, that box lasted maybe five years and then I went to this Ultra Pro. I've done a review on this Ultra Pro already. I'm not very happy with it. The drawers don't lock very good. You really have to push hard, but this is an old outdated box. I paid 1700 bucks for this box way back when, way too much. Um, that, that was what the boxes were going for around that time. I thought the Ultra Pro was a good name. I'm very disappointed with it overall. I'm honestly waiting for Milwaukee's new box. Uh, I've seen one at the show and very reasonable price. I think they're like a thousand bucks. Um, their latest model or their last model was down to seven or eight hundred bucks and a good quality box for decent price allows you to still buy decent tools and precision tools things like your torque wrench or impact guns things like that I didn't skimp on if I'm torquing a engine together I need to know that that is 90 foot pounds and it's not 86 or 78 or whatever it is um, so I splurged on the expensive stuff, expensive multimeter. Um, we've got a couple of reviews on those, so you can check them out. And if you realize two years in, you hate doing the work, you hate your boss, you hate um, crawling underneath uh, vehicles with salt dropping off on you in the winter, it's not the end of the world to sell the box. If you go out and buy an $8,000 toolbox um, and realize you hate it two years later, um, you wanna be the guy that's buying his toolbox, not the one selling it. So. Um, if you don't want to go new, keep your eye open for great deals uh, on, on locally. Don't feel bad about paying 20 cents on the dollar. It's just, that's the way it is. So from there, I kept building, I kept building my collection of tools. I think in total, I have about, I think once I figured it out roughly, I have about seven, $8,000 into my toolbox. 
and this was basically enough to do every job that I've done so far. Now I'm not a specialty shop, so I do a little bit of everything. I'm not gonna go out and buy every single tool. I get lots of comments saying, there's a tool for that, there's a tool for that. I know there is, but I need to do the job now, and if it takes me a couple days to get the tools, I don't care, I'll make my own. Uh, something like a barring tool to turn over the 5.9 Cummins. It's right back at the flywheel. Yeah, it's handy, but you can also grab the alternator with a 15 16 or a 7.8 socket and lean against the tensioner and turn the engine over right there in front of you. Sometimes you just need a little bit of imagination and you don't need to spend all that money. So once I had the box, after um, I worked for somebody for seven years, I decided I wanted to go on my own and built my own house and shop. Uh, I was smart with my money, so we were able to build this 48 by 64. Now it was entirely absorbed in the mortgage of my house. The $40,000 it cost me to put up 16 foot high walls, 48 by 64, um, put roof steel on and cladding on the outside was entirely sucked out. That was $40,000 I had to take from the house um, that the bank uh, would give us because they wouldn't give us anything for the shop. Kind of silly, but I worked out of the shop for two years without any insulation in it, no heat, so I could save up and spray foam the whole shop. And now we have heated floors. I, I poured heated floors with uh, a geothermal that runs from the house. Very happy with that. It was worth forking out up front because the heated floor is like nothing else. Um, you pressure wash a truck off and 10 minutes later the floor is dry again. It's amazing. It's a very even heat and it's not like a tube heater where you're cooking underneath the tube heater and your tools are frozen on the other side of the shop. Again, it depends what climate you're living in. So that being said, I moved into the shop before um, we uh, were actually done the shop. The first thing I did uh, once I got a very big excavating company as a customer, I poured a floor. The floor came before the insulation and the cladding came on the inside. Working in there for two years, it allows you to kind of get a feel for the shop. Um, your kind of rotation, okay, I, I started out with my lathe in this corner and then realized that it's much better in the back corner. I didn't always have a, a spray booth, but decided that that was um, worth it doing a bunch of our restorations afterwards. Um, I used the two post hoist at another shop on a truck and realized that I wanted a four post. Um, I used to have my oil tanks because I was doing a lot more uh, heavy equipment stuff in between those two doors. So I didn't run hydro there because I said, oh, I, I don't need um, electricity there because I got two oil tanks there. Hydroelectric. Oh. What's hydro? I don't know. Hydroelectric? <laughs> So we, we call it hydro because Those we live. Dumb Canadians <laughs> run run everything off water. I guess it's yeah. hydro one, hydroelectric. Yeah. So if I say hydro, I mean electric. I know hydro is the movement of water, but the movement of water is how we get our hydro. I mean our electricity, unless now it's wind. So should we call it wind? <laughs> um, four years, five years later, I stopped doing a lot of the heavy equipment, doing a lot of smaller stuff. Replaced the tanks with a bench. Now I don't have electricity there. So uh, not a big deal, we're going to run some hydro down from the light and just a couple plugs so when the light is on I have hydro and when the uh, lights are off the hydro stops. So um, when we poured the floor there was a couple things I did, I actually have eye hooks in the floor here. When you're setting up your shop it's always good to think ahead and uh, this one little thing if you are pouring a floor in your own shop you need one of these. Just give me a minute here because it's, it's here somewhere. As you can see, all it is is a, a clevis on a plate of steel that's able to fold down just like in a trailer and then lay down when you're not using it. And you can also see that somebody drove over my homemade little uh, rotisserie there and bent my pipe down. So to bend, bend it back up again, you can either talk dirty to it and get it excited and get it to straighten out. but. Yeah, that didn't work. So all you do is chain it to the eyelet, take a jack, and jack up. And make short work of something that could otherwise take a long time. It's going. And there goes the bolt. <laughs> I guess I need a lot bigger than a quarter inch bolt. Anyway, this is actually a giant plate of steel underneath here. And actually this is pushing on that plate of steel as well. So it's, it's all the way around. So that's super handy for 
bending like a hay wagon axle or whatever you can put a 20 ton hydraulic jack underneath that and straighten it right out when you're pouring your floor put some of those in and also think about putting like a plate of steel just underneath the uh, or just on the surface of it of the floor and what happens is if you're doing if you're welding something you can just attach your clamp to that plate and then put whatever you're welding on on top of that plate and you've got a ground everywhere so um, then you don't have to anyway we'll make another video about that later so here we go I've got two of them spread out here so that I can come in through the door and tie something down and straighten it this was really handy for rebuilding hydraulic cylinders too because you can hang them off the cherry picker um, if you're if you've got them in a vise and you're pulling if you go crooked on the cylinder at all it binds in there you can't pull it out but with gravity if you hold it through the eyelet you can just basically take a cherry picker or a forklift tie it to the floor and pull the cylinder apart um, finding a way to steady the cylinder so it doesn't fall very very simple and very easy to do now once I got the flow for the shop um, keep in mind that we're always playing catch-up and we didn't have a pile of money um, the first thing I did when uh, I started doing the conversions was get my hoist. So the hoist was the next big investment. Um, I don't, I'm getting older, I don't feel like crawling up and down underneath uh, vehicles all the time. So that is a good investment. Unfortunately, a lot of hoists are still too low. So basically that's the height that I set it at. And then I, I have my little roller stool and then I just work sitting down. Now you can see that um, as you're working, you accumulate more parts, you accumulate more tools. Um, I have a, a storage uh, truck box outside where a lot of the parts go in. We'll take you guys through there later. But um, my latest investment that I wanted to show you guys is these toolbox workbenches. Now these, uh, a, lot, a lot more stuff is coming um, offshore, so they're all made in China, but the quality is starting to really pick up a bit. Um, what I did was I ran all my electricity behind the walls because I didn't want to see conduit hanging out all over the shop. Um, so basically I had the, the hydro coming through the walls and then poking out through a 2x8 that I ran all the way around the perimeter of the shop. So I can nail anything or hang anything off of this 2x8 I know that I'm getting, uh, I, I'm not looking for the strapping behind it. I ran the, the uh, airline in the uh, leftover PEX line. I glued the ends and crimped them on and so far so good. So I've got some air lines poking out at each bench and ran no shortage of plugs behind the benches. Now if it was five years ago I would have said make sure to put your plugs at the front of the bench because everything is corded so you're not plugging in. Um, if you're working you got something on the bench you're not reaching over and plugging in you can plug into the, the bench at the front and use your drill or whatever grinder, but a lot of stuff is going more cordless. You see I've got three chargers on the bench here. Um, I will put a plug in between these benches right here. That's handy for an extension cord. If we do need to do something in the shop, then it's not dragging over top of the, the bench either. Um, be selective with your benches. There's two kinds of guys out there where if you have benches, you just throw more shit on it. Um, I'm a little bit of both. I work a lot and work late and I hit the wall and I kind of drop my tools and go to bed and that leaves for a messy shop. If the shop is clean, um, you, try, you tend to try and stay up on it more. So I'm at that point right now where I just got so frustrated that I had to stop. I had to get these benches. I paid 1500 bucks for each bench. They're almost just shy of 10 feet and has 20 drawers in it. I think I have four drawers left that don't have anything in it. So imagine everything in here was in the shop somewhere with no real home to it. We're gonna basically work our way around the whole shop, build it the way that I want, but it takes time and it takes money, so it's not gonna happen right away. Um, we'll be doing small improvements as we go. Um, basically, I have enough storage space now that these benches will suffice. Again, I think later we'll be getting more cabinets. Um, I'll take you guys through this one. My first original benches were just counters that came out of a greenhouse demolition that we did and these are actually um, old truck boxes, tool boxes that were on a, uh, an old pickup truck at a yard somewhere. I just grabbed them, splashed some paint on it and they work for now. Um, another upgrade that we have, these are these old um, high bay lights where they suck a lot of hydro and they make a lot of noise. 
So I got, I, I, I just bought one for now, just one of these LED bulbs off of uh, Amazon. We'll put the link on there. Um, I, in this video, it's not gonna be installed, so I can't tell you whether it works good or not. We'll try one. If it works, then um, we'll buy some more. I don't know if you can see it. The lights um, I put on leftover Cannonball track. So depending where I'm working, I can slide the light over a little bit so I'm never in the dark. I basically just take a broom handle or whatever and I can shove the light over about 10 feet. So if it's on top of a hood or on top of then I completely messed up on that one. But at that, that's one of those things I'm talking about. That light is pointing on the hood of the, the or the, the roof of the car and I angled it so I can see the, the pathway. But when I hung that light, the mezzanine wasn't there, the paint booth wasn't there, and this hoist wasn't there. And I wasn't thinking of that. Originally, I was gonna go with a two post, um, and I actually, with the heated floor, I have two big circles where I didn't pour, didn't run the lines, and ran the concrete thicker, and then realized I don't want a two post, so I went with a four post. And that's what I'm talking about. Things change as you go. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, and basically, I think it's good to watch a lot of these videos or walk through a shop and say, that's the shop that I want, that's the layout that I want, that's gonna work for the equipment that I'm working on, that, that's gonna work for the, the stuff I, I plan on doing, but keep in mind that things change. Um, I wanna label my boxes so I know what's in there, but I'm not going to for a bit because more than likely I'm going to move some drawers around. One is gonna be all welding, one column is gonna be all my, my paint tools and my bodywork tools and my Sandpaper is all going to be in a row, but I might want to move those later. Um, those, again, we'll put the link on it or the phone number if you guys want to buy those boxes. Uh, basically, on Instagram, when I post it, there were a lot of people saying, I have those boxes and I'm really happy with them. They're holding up okay. For that section, I think we're going to go to a company called Muddy River Wholesale, and they have a different box. I like that layout. Those are at a 10 foot or 7 foot, and that's an 8 foot space. So I kind of want to fill that whole 8 feet. Um, with toolboxes and benches, but that will be in another month or so when we bring in some more money. So I um, hope you enjoyed this. Sorry for my rambling. I hope it all makes sense. We'll slowly be working our way around. And if you have any comments down below, if you have those toolboxes or if you've tried the ones from Muddy River Wholesale, let me know. And um, we'll put the link up for the light. And yeah, like, subscribe. And definitely hit up our Facebook group if you have questions on shop layout or any on your tracks or whatever it is. Lots of guys out there that are willing to help. And um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see it for now. For now, I'm very happy with that. It's actually starting to look like a professional shop. Um, never thought they'd have a race car in my shop when I was working on excavators three years ago, four years ago. So thanks for watching. Here we go.